Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this little fella right here, Walking in Birano. This is a new Essen release for Emperor S4. And it is a neat little uh, city building card laying game where you're trying to uh, create the most point-filled neighborhood in Murano. And you do that by uh, coupling different features on the houses, cats, and potted plants, and awnings, and store shops, and all of this kind of stuff with the different tourists that are coming by and visiting the neighborhood and uh, different citizens that are already there and trying to help you score more points. Let's get down to the table. I'll show you how it works, and then we'll come back with some final thoughts in just a few moments. Let's get to it. So here I have set up for you a two-player game of Walking in Burano uh, from Emperor S4 Games. So basically what you're trying to do here is you're trying to build up your neighborhood of houses using these different um, cards that are going to make up the different levels of your houses. So you have a first level, second level, and then third level. When one person has built uh, five houses in their neighborhood, the game will end and with everybody having taken the same number of turns, and then houses are scored using the different uh, uh, characters and tourists that have been visiting the neighborhood and then whoever has the most points at the end of that is the winner. On your turn you're basically going to do three things. You're going to first of all acquire floor cards from the tableau that's out here and that will come they will come into your hand and then you'll be able to uh, place those cards into your neighborhood by uh, spending money in order to do that. When you're taking cards from the tableau here you must take from a single column. You can't take from multiple columns. It has to be from one. You can start from the bottom and work up or start from the top and go down. But you can never skip the first or third floors and just take the second floor. You have to go up from the bottom or down from the top. Now, if somebody had already taken a uh, third floor or a first floor and left the other two, then you could come in from the top and just take the second level. But normally, you must come in from the top or the bottom and take either three floor cards, so you could take the entire column, or you can take just two floor cards and one gold, or you can take just one floor card and two gold. So for example, maybe on my first turn, I'm going to go ahead and take these two as well. And uh, everybody starts with two scaffolding cards, uh, which will help you uh, because since I don't have a bottom level here, I'm going to be able to place those. Now, in order to place these, I have to spend money to do that. The first card that I place is going to be for one money. And then the second card will add two to that. So to place two cards out there, I'll have to spend three gold uh, into the supply like so. Now on my opponent's turn, uh, they're going to go ahead and take this card and place it, uh, let's just say right here in between the two scaffolds like so. And uh, then that's going to make them pay $1 to do that. But since they only took one uh, card, they're going to be able to take two gold already. So you'll take a card and two gold and then they'll pay one gold uh, to be able to play that into their neighborhood. Then once everybody has rebuilt, we get ready for the next round by refilling the positions that are here. In a two-player game, the rightmost cards are discarded and then these are flipped over and all of the spaces in between are filled. Now on my second turn, I'm going to go ahead and take from this column here and they come up into my hand. Uh, and since I only took two, I'm also going to be able to take one coin from the supply. And then I'm going to go ahead and play one card down into my tableau like so, uh, spending a coin to do that. This card I don't want to play yet because, I, first of all, I can't afford it. Plus, I don't want to know if, I don't even know if I'm going to use it just yet. So that's going to stay in my hand. Now, once I have completed a building in my uh, neighborhood, it's going to be visited by either a character, which is over here, a, a person, you know, a citizen, somebody who lives in the town, or a tourist. Now the tourists and the inhabitants over here are the ones that are going to be helping you score more points for the buildings that you're uh, placing into your neighborhood uh, throughout the course of the game. So for example, this tourist here is going to give you one point for every uh, green potted plant. This tourist is going to give you one point for every red or yellow potted plant. This tourist is going to give you two points for each of these features that are found in your house. 
and then this one is going to be giving you three points per cat. So if I chose to use it on here, I have one, two cats, that would be six points. Uh, if I chose this one, I have a chimney, I have a cat, I also have a few awnings that are here, and I also have another cat down here. So this guy was going to be giving me two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 points for this town. So we're gonna go ahead and take him and he's going to visit my house and that's denoted by simply placing him uh, on the underside of that house and he's gonna score those points at the end of the game for me. On my opponent's turn, he's going to go ahead and just take this uh, green bottom floor and two coins and we'll go ahead and uh, place that there like so and we'll put this over here like that. Now the shops are just like regular uh, bottom floors, but they're going to be giving me three and two points respectively. Now these are both the same kind of shop. If you look at the uh, shop owner here, which is one of the inhabitants that you can have visit your home once you finish it, he's going to give you uh, bonus points for having different kinds of shops in your area. So those are the kinds of things that you can look forward to. Now he will have had to have spent one coin uh, to place that there, and that's the end of his turn. All of the rightmost cards are done away with in a two-player game, that is. And these are scooted over like so and the spaces are filled. And that's generally how the game is going to continue until, as I said earlier, one person has completed five houses and then uh, with everybody having taken an equal number of turns, the game ends, points are tabulated using a uh, score sheet that does come in the game, and uh, whoever has the most points is the winner. Now, a couple of other things about the inhabitants over here. We went over the um, blah, blah, blah. we went over the shop owner here, but the florist is going to be able to give you one point for every uh, yellow or red potted plant in a, a three column wide section of your um, housing development. The gardener is going to give you the same thing for uh, the green potted plants. Uh, Santa Claus here is going to give you three points per chimney that is in your neighborhood um, up on the third levels. The police officer here is going to give you uh, bonus points equal to how many uh, lamps you have, street lamps you have, uh, that are non-adjacent to each other. Uh, so if you have only one non-adjacent, he gives you five points. If you have two that are not adjacent to each other, then they'll get nine points. And if you can have three, uh, which is the most, you get 15. The mayor down here is going to give you one point for every uh, citizen that you have walking in your neighborhood. So for example, right here, there's one, two in this one, whereas on mine, I have one, two, three, but there possibly could be more. He'll give you one point for each of those uh, people that are visiting your neighborhood. The tailor here is going to give you four points for each pair of blue and red awnings that are on your houses, and it takes the entire uh, five by three grid into account uh, when they're when she's counting that. Now, a couple other things that we do need to make sure we mention is the fact that first of all, your houses should always be the same color. Um, so you, all three floors should be one color. Like I have a pink house here. Uh, I would not be able to, for example, uh, place a green second floor here because that would be breaking the rule. Uh, additionally, you're not supposed to have houses that uh, are the same color adjacent to each other. Because as you can see, uh, if you look at the houses in Burano, they are uh, different colors all throughout. And so we're trying to recreate that picturesque uh, look. But you do have these tokens here, and these tokens are going to be giving you three points each at the end of the game if you don't use them. What these are going to be, what these are going to allow you to do, is break those two rules that I just spoke to you about. So if you want to take this little greenhouse, the second floor, and place it right here, you can do that. But you'll have to discard one of these three-point tokens, which means you're going to get three less points at the end of the game uh, as, as compared to if you were to keep it. Additionally, uh, when you place a card that breaks one or both of those rules, you have to only get rid of one of these uh, for that. So, for example, if I were to place a pink thing here and it didn't match the rest of uh, the building here, uh, it's gonna be breaking a rule here and here, but I would only have to discard one of these tokens for that placement. So again, as I said, it's just whoever has the most points is the winner.
So that's about that for walking in Burano. Now I have to say that this really does hit home uh, to Emperor S4's uh, normal fare, where it is a very simple game to play. It's a very simple game to teach, but the level of uh, thought complexity that has to go into it and, and uh, how you're going to piece the different things together, what tourists you're going to uh, try to employ to your house, uh, what uh, characters or uh, citizens you're going to have in your helping you score more points. Those are the different thinking ahead kind of things that really go into this game. And it takes uh, what uh, deceptively looks like a very light game and it ratchets it up a little bit not so much that it's not light anymore but you can just tell that there's a lot more meat to the game than originally meets the eye. And with all that being said, I'm going to say this, that is my first pro. It is deceptively meaty. I'll go ahead and say it that way. Uh, because how you play the game, how the game teaches, uh, how the game looks, it's all very simple, it's all very light, but the level of thought complexity that is there uh, really is not what the game looks like. And I like it when games do that because you think, Eh, it's just going to be something, you know, uh, kind of for forgetful, but it really isn't. It, there's just a level of a thought process that has to go into each turn. You have to think ahead. You have to kind of plan ahead. And uh, all of that really gives you a very enjoyable experience. And it's just a much more deep experience than you would have originally thought just looking at the game. And that leads me into my second pro. And the second pro is simply, this is such a colorfully bright game. I love the way it looks on the table. I love how uh, everybody's uh, neighborhood is, looks different as they go through the different things, the different kinds of uh, features that they wanted to include in their neighborhood and how they're going to employ different tourists and different uh, characters to help them score more points. It just looks great on the table and has a great aesthetic appeal to it. And I love it when games are like that because it makes people turn their heads and take interest in what's going on on the table. Another pro for the game for me was the component quality. The cards are all a very nice stock. They're durable. Uh, I, love, I loved the coins that came in it, how they had that very metallic, shiny look to them, uh, which may or may not wear off. I don't think, I haven't had trouble with it wearing off just yet. So we'll have to see how that works out, but looks great right now. The little, I'm not really big into cats, but the little the little cat first player token was also interesting. It was, it was also a neat little addition. Yeah, it's just a, a cardboard standee, but um, it's, it's small, it's cute, I guess you could say, and it looks great on the table, and it fits with the motif of the game as well. So that also was uh, very cool. The component quality did a really good job. I, I like the scoring sheet that comes in the uh, game as well, so that you don't have to, you know, everybody doesn't have to break out their calculators or uh, do it in their head or anything like that they can just write everything down that makes things a lot easier during the scoring phase so component quality was all great in this game now with all that having been said the only real con that I have at the game uh, is that uh, maybe people will look at this and say wow that's a really light game and then they get to play it and it's like oh there's a lot more thought here than I thought Maybe that might be a turnoff factor for some people. It wasn't for me. That's what I love about Emperor S4 games is that they are so simple to teach, so simple to play, and yet the thought processes that you have to use there are very deep, or they can be very deep, uh, but not so deep that it it it, it uh, uh, makes people kind of get paralyzed about their thought processes and the different choices that they have to make. Uh, it just it really kind of skirts that line uh, between uh, being a little bit brain burning and not being brain birdie at all. Uh, so I really enjoy how that, but some people might say, eh, that's not what I was expecting. And because of that, I don't like it. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, but that's really the only thing I can come up with. I really enjoyed this game a lot. And I think that it's going to be one of those games that just kind of sticks around because it's a great, um, filler-esque type game. It only really lasts about 30 to 45 minutes, and usually 30 minutes is right where I want my fillers to go. But because it just kind of goes over just a tad, um, 
it's uh, it, it's I still consider it a filler game, and uh, I think it, it it will fill that role very well in the coming days. So all in all, I'm going to give Walking in Burano a pretty good strong eight out of ten for a filler game. Uh, of course, it doesn't uh, hold up to some of the bigger games that I would give an eight to, but uh, the, for what it is supposed to be a light. Uh, but still thinky game that will take place in about 30 to 40 minutes. I really do enjoy it, and it's one that I think will hit the table a lot uh, here in the future. So I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Really enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun playing it, and I uh, hope to do that more in the future. Well, that's it from me for Walking in Burano, an 8 out of 10. Go check it out if you absolutely can. It's going to be opening at Essen, so if you're at Essen, you can go by their booth and give it a try. But uh, if not... You'll have to wait for a little bit longer. It will be coming out, I believe, in uh, from Deep Water Games here in the in, in the states on the state side of things. So check that out when you can. That's it from me. Walking in Burano, eight out of ten. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. Take care now. <laughs>